Um, hello, everyone, and welcome to our Transmedia Art Seminar. Uh, today, uh, we welcome Sarah Bai Cheng, and, um, uh, and um, uh, the host will be my colleague Ramona Moss. Uh, my name is Magda Romanska, and I'm co chairing the seminar with Ramona. Um, the seminar is co sponsored by uh, Mahindra Humanities Center at Harvard and Meta Lab at Harvard. We thank uh, both organizations, both institutions, for uh, for support and for maintaining the seminar. This is our third year. Um, so we are thrilled that we are able to do that. And we are thrilled to welcome uh, Sarah. So I'm going to pass the baton today to Ramona to continue and introduce Sarah to us. All right, thank you very much, Magda. So yeah, so um, I have the joy and honor really to be co-chairing this seminar this year uh, for the first time together with Magda, um, who's been such an amazing force, I think, at building such a beautiful event series. And um, and it's really been amazing. I was an audience member, now I'm part co-chairing it and I'm really excited about it. So um, so yeah, and I've, we've already had this year, this is our fourth iteration um, of the Transmedia Arts Seminar this year. And we've had some very interesting sessions already on the future of opera, on digital archiving and the intermixing of film and theater um, and so today um, it is our very particular pleasure to welcome Sarah Bei Cheng as our speaker um, and needless to say really Sarah you need no introduction um, since you've been so much at the forefront of shaping this field of transmedia and digital performance cultures and um, and so, but for good measure, I will do it anyway. So, um, so yes, yeah, so Sarah Beijing is, uh, Beijing is currently the Dean of the School of the Arts, Media and Performance and Design and a professor in the Department of Theatre and Performance at York University in Toronto, Canada. And she's also taught in theatre and performance um, at Bowdoin College, University of uh, Buffalo and Colgate University and was a visiting professor and Fulbright Scholar at Utrecht University. Um, her research focuses on the intersections of theater, media, and digital technologies in performance um, and brings together theory and practice, teaching, teaching research, and, um, and making. Um, and among her um, prominent publications are Performance and Media, Taxonomies for a Changing Field, with, um, um, together with Jennifer Parker Starbuck and David um, Zoltz. And she also coded an anthology, Mapping Intermediality in Performance. And, and I'm really excited about this. Um, what's Coming is a book on digital historiography and um, performance, so um, co-authored with Deborah Kaplan. So, um, and she also works as a director and dramaturg, and was a co-founding a founding co-host for On Tap, a theatre and performance studies podcast that um, I think many people know. Um, so yeah, I, and I'm more than curious now about the topic of your talk, Sarah, which is entitled Data Drama, How Machine Audiences Reprogram Theater. Um, and it's so exciting because I think in Germany, we're just about talking about machines in performance and not necessarily about the machine transformations on all other fronts of, um, of the theater machine itself. So um, I am sure that um, this is gonna push the question of digitization in theater and performance um, even further and yet to another level. So with that, um, I'll hand it over to you and um, I'm really looking forward to your talk. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both of you for that very kind uh, introduction and, and for this uh, invitation. I've been a great uh, admirer and follower of, of the series. So I, I wanna thank um, Magda and, and Ramona, you know, and, and everyone in the Mohindra Center, uh, the Meta Lab, Harvard University, Freie Universität Berlin, um, for this opportunity to, to talk with you today and, and share uh, some ideas and, and, and what is still cer certainly some, some early, early work. Um, uh, so if I could ask everyone to please lower your expectations um, and, and perhaps standards, that would be, um, that would be very helpful. Um, I'm just going to Okay, um, I'm I'm assuming that that people can now see see my screen. Um, if you can't, I don't know, raise some kind of alarm. Um, I'll start by just clarifying that this is not a talk about artificial intelligence. I'm not a, an expert in in AI, machine learning, or neural networks. What programming I once knew has become eclipsed by advances such that my understanding of computational foundations in contemporary digital art echoes the short story flowers for Algernon when the narrator confronts prior research notebooks only to discover that earlier insights have become incomprehensible due to cognitive decline. 
And since I am currently employed as an academic administrator, my own decline may not come as a complete surprise to some assembled here. This latest research, that was a joke. I don't know, if, I can't see if anyone's laughing. So, um, and apologies if my boss is in the room. Um, my latest research um, is also distinct. I just wanna clarify from the latest discussions of machine learning in artistic creation um, and debates regarding the agency of artificial creativity. Though perhaps like some of you, I've been following with interest the most recent and the flashiest tools, Lensa, Dolly, Dolly 2, Stable Diffusion. Um, and you'll see a few examples carelessly included in this talk, mea culpa. The heralding of autonomous creation has been coming for some time and I'm, I'm certainly not immune to its char charms, um, but that's also not really what this talk is about. Um, so what am I doing other than wasting your time? Um, the, the focus of my talk is less about machines as artists, but rather as audiences. Specifically, and thinking for this, audience in particular, theater audiences. And, and in this, there are two parts, one optimistic and a second more critical, or as we may remember from the theater, there we go. So part one, comedy. Theatrical performance presents a particular challenge for representation in digital networks as perhaps a belated validation of Peggy Phelan's claim that performance resists reproduction. It is difficult to represent accurately theatrical performance in and as data. That is to capture and circulate the distinct features of performance across networks in and as machine readable information. Unlike text, images, and even music, all of which have found ways to be reproducible and interoperable within digital networks, and therefore searchable and increasingly predictable online, both the dynamics, temporality, and multidisciplinary vocabularies of theatrical performance and its elements, and the lack of consistent ontologies around these, make our work difficult to quantify and even more difficult to predict and, and locate in the semantic web. Although historical information about theater can and has been quantified, analyzed, and shared, the qualities of live production, whether or not this includes temporal or physical co-presence or not, make it difficult to include within those networks that allow it to be recommended, shared, or fed to us, and in systems that increasingly dictate our awareness and access to those performances. So a, a, a way of thinking about this is um, we, we have no Netflix recommender for, theater, for theatrical production really yet. Um, and when you go to a particular space or a particular city, um, when you arrive, you don't have the same kind of access to the particularities of your geolocation in, in response to what theater um, or other kinds of live events, so dance performance um, might be available. And of course you may be thinking, why should we care? Um, isn't this one of theater's great advantages, that it can reside and remain outside of data and surveillance regimes? Okay, so perhaps that's a fair point. Um, but the lack of representability simultaneously presents very particular challenges for theater artists as our prospective audiences move online and expect arts, entertainment, and culture to come to them. The lack of consistent accounting affects quantitative measures of both the social and cultural impact of the arts. And I would say also the intensity and effect of research and scholarship in and around the performing arts. We further miss opportunities for the unique affordances of digitally networked research. As Miguel Escobar Varela for, for one has outlined, the features of performance studies with its variety of objects of study and intersections particularly benefits from this approach. As he wrote in 2016, quote, the semantic web can be used to link performances according to different perspectives at the same time. The links enable search and retrieve functions, but they also allow for a multiplicity of perspectives to be simultaneously represented. It can enable us to map the complex topology, the edges and nodes of performance's sophisticated disagreement. The end of the quote. Varela focuses on the opportunities and challenges for performance studies and research, and has, uh, um, as a, has followed this approach to performance representation online. But I would argue that the benefits are not just academic. Recognizing the same landscape in 2017, the Canadian Association Presenting Arts Association published, or CAPACOA, 
published its digital innovation assessment. In that they wrote, digitizing the performing arts as an assessment of opportunities, issues, and challenges. And noting in the rationale for their work, they wrote that as audiences gain the ability to curate their own content and seek, con um, and seek that content on multiple devices and platforms, artists and arts organizations have had to respond to new intermediaries, such as search engines, applications, video and audio streaming services, online booksellers, or on-demand downloading options. As has been widely discussed in, in, in this forum, among others, the COVID-19 pandemic and updates to social media, right, the so-called feed, and, co and continuous scrolling has only accelerated these trends. According to the Consumer Trend Survey for 2022, audiences in the demographics of Gen Z and millennial prefer TikTok to streaming um, or television. Right, so this is just a kind of overview, and you can sort of look at it. Um, I, you know, I'm a good Gen, Gen Xer, so um, I still think you know TV is radical. Um, but you can see the way that these trends these trends are moving. Right, asked if they could only watch TikTok or TV stream. Right, so this is like you can only watch one. What would you pick? And 66% of Gen Z, 53% of millennials chose TikTok. Right, and this is a platform that hasn't even been around very long. The same report, um, uh, the same uh, survey further reports that users spend more time and experience more satisfaction on, on TikTok. In that same survey, Android users um, reported spending an average of almost 100 minutes per day on TikTok, compared with 76 on YouTube and 53 and 52 on Facebook and Instagram, respectively. Unlike other forms of social media, TikTok also makes people feel good. Um, in, re in response to questions about feeling, 53% of TikTok users reported feeling happy and 51 feeling amused. Other significant reports included feeling, quote, more culturally aware, 27%, and more globally aware, 22%. Um, and then, and then the, the best, perhaps, for, for those of us who teach, um, uh, TikTok users were um, nearly um, a little over 18% reported feeling more successful and smarter when using the app. Negative emotions, inadequate, stressed, sad, and angry were all reportedly in the single digits. Finally, as has been widely publicized, um, including a, a story in, in the New York Times a few months ago, these same demographics are increasingly turning to TikTok for information, preferring it to Google when they're searching for particular, um, uh, as, a, as a dedicated search function or to find particular information. So for our purposes, thinking about TikTok in this is, is that it is driving cultural discovery with users finding new music and food via the app, um, and as well as a whole range of other things. And it's making people feel good to do that. Ironically, and I mean this in the sense of the original reference to tragic irony, these sites have also become important locations for theatrical production. As Trevor Buffoni has argued recently in TikTok is theater, theater is TikTok. He writes, as we scroll TikTok, we become spectators and fellow collaborators. As we comment and interact with videos, we engage with TikTok's meme culture, which holds tremendous power to launch random creators from anonymity into internet fame. As we engage in the culture of virality, we facilitate a real-time theater history that dictates which memes will penetrate the meme archive and become embedded in popular culture. As we create videos, we embody TikTok. We collectively engage with TikTok. We partake in the app's theatricality, conveying how TikTok is not just theater in the future, but theater in the present. So taking a step back from this for a moment, uh, we might recognize then that theater's um, potential and current audiences, as well as a significant part of its archive and history, are increasingly performing and consuming per these performances in spaces where the theater itself, as we might imagine it, even across a broad array, is not uh, easily reproducible or findable, even as these sites are actively shaping our collective understanding of the very idea of theater and theatrical performance. It may be tempting then to update the anxiety of theater is dead for contemporary digital culture. Once threatened with displacement by film, television, and video games, Today's interactive social media platforms loom large over a new generation of theater creators and audiences. 
One effect of data representation in theater is already visible. The influence of the individual tastemaker has significantly declined. With algorithms distributing and prioritizing content to audiences, preferences, tastes, and aesthetic opinions are increasingly if subtly shaped by digital algorithmic recommendations, both overt in online reviews and commentary across platforms. I'm, I'm thinking of the common practice that many of us both consume and participate in of, of putting our programs on Instagram and then thoughts about shows that we're seeing underneath them. And of course, more subtly in the very choices that are presented to us, what we even think of as, as having access. The human recommender, whether journalist, academic, or trusted friend, online or otherwise, has given way to an algorithmic one. Um, and so one of the things that, that you can sort of do in your own in your own experience is just look at when you like, you know, Google search or or any kind of search um, for, for theater in a location and what what comes to the fore, right? What 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 do you see? And of course, this is over time shaped by what you've what you've searched before, what your cache is in the um, in the in the search engine that you're using, if you're if you have one, um, as well as things that are that are being pushed through the algorithm, both um, uh, overtly in the in the case of promoted and and ads, Google ads that come to the top, as well as more subtly and things that are just making their way up the algorithm. Relying on search engine optimization, um, organizations such as Capicoa have outlined the need to make performing arts more discoverable and therefore available to algorithmic audiences. Um, so this is the this is a, I'm going to really talk about kind of two different research projects. This is this is the first, and then I'll talk about the the other one in my tragedy section. Um, so to this end, a contingent of researchers in the performing arts, um, based mostly right now um, in Canada, but in collaboration elsewhere, have been working on this question through the performing arts informa information representation um, World Wide Web Community um, uh, Working Group. Um, and as part of this working group, we've been talking with artists, organizations, and presenters to develop an ontology for the pre presentation of performance online. The project has engaged collaborators and teams working on, on other kinds of related projects, uh, many connected to historical pre preservation and archives. So, so one of our, our partners in this is LADEPA, the Linked Open Data Ecology for the Performing Arts, um, as well as a coalition of performing arts presenters such as Capicoa, among others. To ensure that this work is driven first and foremost by artists, we've worked with um, diverse groups as, as funded fellows, including indigenous, black, racialized, immigrant, two-spirit, LGBTQ plus performers and organizations, and a variety of groups uh, across Canada, um, especially noting the need for rural and northern communities um, to participate in, in how we might develop a shared vocabulary in this shared ontology. Um, a lot of what these contributions have, have come in the form of use cases. I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and these are all archived and, and available open source on, on GitHub if you're interested, and I can share that information with you. Working in collaboration with those um, from, a, from both the performing arts and information and data science, our goal has been to ensure that the full measure and diversity of performing arts can be understood and shared within an ontology created for and by artists themselves and accessible to diverse audiences online. Um, and I should just also say uh, a, a word of thanks and recognition to uh, the collaborators on this and, and, the, and the real people who are driving this. Um, Mario Marshall, uh, who's a wonderful uh, York alum and friend and collaborator, um, Frederic Julien, who's um, with Capicoa, um, and Danielle, Daniela Rousseau, um, who's at, both at York and, and University of Toronto as, as key, key collaborators in this. Um, and if, I, I want to be very clear, we're not the first to attempt this kind of project. Other theater anthologies have been and, and I'm sure are being developed. In 2018, a research group from University of Turin developed Drummer, a comprehensive ontological resource on drama. Um, this is a, one of their images from it. Um, but like most digital resources related to theater and, and particularly in the context of ontology, uh, drama focuses largely on text and dramaturgy rather than the elements of, of performance itself. The project of Pair has been to account for the performance elements beyond the text and to create an interoperable resource across platforms that can facilitate a greater exchange of information of not only drama, but also the performances themselves, even in the ability to predict or anticipate what performances might be forthcoming. 
This exchange of information in the performing arts is permeated by complex concepts that contain a great deal of ambiguity. So our work has been to reduce or eliminate these amb ambiguity in communication with the goal to affect significant positive changes in various applications such as search, discovery, archiving of works, assessing the social impact of the arts and the research associated with it. The representational framework that we have developed is a mid-level ontology for the performing arts or MILOPA. The, the, the acronyms get a little bonkers, so apologies on that. Um, this has been developed in order to help improve communication exchanges. Milopa's contribution is, is providing clear formal definitions for complex, complex concepts and properties. This representational framework is made available using formal structuring mechanisms of the ont ontology web language or OWL, um, which provides an appropriate web compatible uh, approach. And just for this may be redundant for some of you, but just to kind of clarify and, and think through, you know, what an ontology is, um, you know, an, an ontology both in, in computer science and information science, so apologies to the philosophers among us, um, is a formal representation of knowledge by a set of concepts within the domain and the relationship uh, relationships among those concepts. Um, Ontologies enable us to represent knowledge within information systems and are most often used for archives, catalogs, and databases, hence the connection to archival and, and um, or information and library science, but are also now essential for search and discovery. They help us identify and communicate concepts and relationships within a, a bounded group of no, a domain of knowledge. And to that end, we continue to work on consensus on terms and their axioms within the performing arts. To give you a brief, a bit of uh, a, a little bit of what this looks like, the Malopa ontology is intended as a framework that can be used to reduce ambiguity and therefore make uh, these terms inter, inter, uh, computer interoperable. For example, in the performing arts, people often use the word production uh, for various concepts, and it and it can be a somewhat uh, loaded term. Take for example. Um, you know, did you see that amazing production of controlled damage by Andrea Scott? What production elements did you like the most, right? So, okay, here are two, uh, two uses of the same word, meaning, meaning slightly different things, but, th the, but that slight difference can completely change how it is received and understood and, and replicated. Um, so this term, this word production requires disambiguation in these two instances. And rather than using a different word in each case, Milopa has two different classes that can be used to separate and distinguish the, its meanings. So using Milopa to achieve, achieve this, the two uses could be clarified like so. Right, so we see, did you see that amazing, right, the performance work as opposed to tangible realization element. And, and if this seems kind of tortured, it, it, it certainly can be the the you know the language that is required in order to create some of the separation becomes becomes rather complicated, um, and even you know for for you know those of us who really value smooth grammatical communication, um, uh, a little awkward, uh, but it becomes encodable and allows us to to start to think about these things and and really in essence to allow machines to talk to each other. So this is not for a human audience per se. It's really about how do we do some of this some of this work as well? Given the unique opportunity of representing the performing arts domain ontologically, we have to ask ourselves how existing representations of performance are working to represent these concepts in the domain and how new made modes of thinking may address existing gaps. Um, and we've started to have a little bit of success with this. Um, we'll be publishing the ontology um, in the next several months. Um, and it's also then thinking at the same time of how how this uh, how and where this will be used and 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 to what ends and really thinking about um, again this focus on use cases and and that center artists and and um, and organizations and scholars and so um, a few of our use cases and constituents are are sort of outlined here. Um, one of the the I could talk about this a little bit, but a related research project that I'm um, that I'm a, a co applicant on, but that's being run uh, with colleagues um, Natalie Alvarez, who's at the at Toronto Metropolitan University, um, is also looking very particularly at how we measure creative arts impact. So thinking about if we can represent work online and have it be be findable in a lot of different places. 
then perhaps you know we can also start to develop some metrics and use those for for advocacy both within the university um, in government with um, outside funders and foundations and things like this. Um, so um, we're preparing to publish the ontology later this year with the hopes that this will be useful for further efforts in making performance works legible in and as data. Um, and I would argue sometimes people push back a bit about data, but my sense is that um, if we don't define it, someone else is going to define it for us um, as scholars, as artists. And so we really have a, 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 an opportunity right now to do it on our own terms and to, and to essentially create our own vocabulary and our own uh, priorities. Uh, and so I'm really, I, I find this work very exciting and, and I'm grateful to, to, to be a part of it. So, so far, so happy. Okay. Um, tragedy. Um, another dimension of this work, however, must be to critically review what efforts, what effects these efforts may have on the future of, the, of theater production and reception. Um, as the uh, digital arts uh, scholar and artist, uh, Sophia and Audrey notes, quote, machine learning, sets it, machine learning sets the stage for the emergence of art forms that also trigger new forms of art consumption. And so now I'm going to focus a little bit on the second part of that, that, that what, what these changes might do to um, how we look at, at, at theater and who looks at it. Um, assuming that we can inscribe theatrical production within these data structures, what will a theater shaped by and for algorithms look like? And what, if any, is the role of the human critic? Um, so this is this is my my little Dali um, uh, image of, an, of uh, what I typed in was like uh, algorithmic theater um, with human critic in the audience. And, and I, I, I kind of love this, this image. For all of the attention that machine learning and image and textual creation has received, far greater may be the impact on, what, on not what is made and by whom, but how those works are organized digitally and for whom. In relation to programming Ian Chang's artificial life form, BOB, Bag of Beliefs, at London Serpentine Gallery, for instance, Hans Ulrich Obrist noted that his own role could be overtaken by a machine. I'm a curator, Obrist said, but I'd never be arrogant and say that a machine couldn't curate a better show. And indeed, as noted above, um, our, our experience of an access to the arts, including theater, film, and performance of all kinds, is already immersed within an algorithmic logic that pushes information to our attention without our having to actively search for anything. We have fewer decisions to make. Algorithmic culture comes to us. In this process, our own preferences and attention are measured in time investments and are used then to inform future choices. So it, uh, to illustrate the effect of this, both as practice, but also as metaphor, um, I'd like to share the following um, video clip. And we're not gonna have time to watch the whole thing, but but I think you'll watch enough to get a sense of this. Sundarma, 
Okay. Um, so this, if, if you're not already aware, was a performance um, by the company Metaphysic on the semifinals of the television show, America's Got Talent in August, 2022. Presented using so-called deep fake technology, the performance of Puccini's Nesson Dorama from Turandot by three tenors was translated in real time into the projected faces and seemingly also the voices of the three male judges on the show, Simon Cowell, Terry Crews, and Howie Mandel. Although the judges were impressed, as, as you can see, fans of the show, incidentally, were less enthusiastic. And ultimately, the winner was Mayas, uh, the Lebanese all-female alternative dance collective founded by Lebanese choreographer Nadim Shafan. This was their performance. Um, interestingly, also used uh, qualities of illusion um, uh, digital context and this interplay of the physical and, and the and the digital, um, as did the 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 second place winner, um, which was the Australian pole dancer Christy Sellers. Um, but um, and so she did also does these kind of amazing um, interactive performances um, on these poles and, and aerial feats uh, that interact with the digital images before them. For those of you who remember George Coates back from the 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 eighties and early nineties. There's a, there's a lot of that kind of flavor in, in her work as well. Um, I, I raise this because I think America's Got Talent is a good example for the study of algorithmic uh, theater reception, uh, because more than just performance, it is also the performance of performance criticism. Those shows such as the Idol franchise, the X Factor, et cetera, so you think you can dance, um, we have developed a pop, pop cultural awareness of what the performance of the critic might look like. And more to the point here, what performance criticisms of one own of one's own image collected and performed back to you might uh, might feel like. And and just so you know, this is this was um, Cal's reaction if in from the from the video. What was compelling in the example of of America's Got Talent and the and the deep fake opera performance, and the critical reception of the judges, was that they were essentially given the performance of themselves to judge. With so much work now circulating online, most especially in the wake of the pandemic, the performing arts are, have become increasingly reliant on networks that favor similarity. In other words, we become increasingly seduced by a culture that reflects ourselves back to us. And the next question is, who are we? As Sophie Bishop has written in her essay, Influencer Creep, it, she writes, influencer creep has a particular impact on artists who in some respects resemble influencers. They both try to make a living by translating their aesthetic sensibility for audiences in distinct or ingenious or familiar ways. And as anyone who has ever engaged with any kind of social media marketing knows, it can be a challenge to strike the right balance between distinctive and familiar, particularly when algorithms overwhelmingly favor dominant trends, shared proximity, and other kinds of similarities, or what sociologists have identified as homophily. Um, and I won't go into a, 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 a huge definition of this now, except to say that, you know, that, that homophilia is best understood as a principle um, that contact between similar people occurs at a higher rate than dissimilar people, and that we tend to, to reinforce that in cultural, behavioral, but also genetic and material information that flows through networks. More recently, Wendy Chun has demonstrated homophilia as a key characteristic of digital networks the fundamental organization and our engagement within them. In a 2019 essay, Querying Homophily, she observes that, quote, homophily is the mechanism by which individuals stick together, a we emerge. It also serves, she writes, as an alibi for the inequality it maps, while also obviating politics. Homophily, often allegedly of those discriminated against, not racism, sexism, and inequality, becomes the source of inequality, making injustice natural and ecological, end quote. So there's a kind of consensus that we are trying to, that we seek in our ontologies that may have in this context a more ominous implications, right? If we manage to love our neighbor, Chun argues, it is because our neighbors are virtually ourselves. And again, in the America's Got Talent, we see this reflected back to us. Her observations reminded me of the 1990 film Total Recall by Paul Verhoeven and, and starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and Sharon Stone. 
Um, and the reason is that that the movie poster, um, and this is this is one of the movie posters from the from the 1990s, included this tagline. It might be too small on your screens. I don't know. Um, which is, um, how would you know if someone stole your mind? And this this quote, this context um, may remind us also of, of Marshall McLuhan's observation in 1970 when he reflected, like Philip K. Dick, and whose story we can remember it for you wholesale was the inspiration for Total Recall. Um, as as a, a particular danger for human connection, if when as we begin to entrust our memory to devices, and McLuhan wrote, as information itself becomes the largest business in the world, data banks know more about individual people than the people do themselves. The more data banks record about each of us, the less we exist. So, as I've been working on these ontologies and thinking about how to build consensus and 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 to encode and embed theatrical production and, and its various elements in these in these spaces. Um, I'm also thinking about Dick's metaphors, McLuhan's writing and, and Chun's observations um, in which we might also ask, how will we know if somebody steals our taste? That is in contemporary culture directed algorithmically and aligned with previously articulated preferences and pleasures, how does anyone know what they really like anymore? As Chun points out, the fundamental danger of homophily is that over time, our own perceptions and opinions become subtly undermined by dominant trends that naturalize a range of biases as simple personal preference or, or and, and ecological alignments. Uh, those of us who teach theater may have observed a similar shift in our own students' critical tendencies with, with the development of, of, a, of a particular criterion, whether a work was or was not, quote, relatable. How might machine audiences reprogram theater? Circulating in and as data within recommender systems, performances, and related research, it seems likely that these will follow other dominant online trends, subject, in other words, to different kinds of influencer creep. We can see various instances in this in the mediatization of theater. For example, online performances that remediate theatrical forms such as musicals, and perhaps even more so in the theatricalization of popular media, such as immersive events, like the Bridgerton experience, where one can experience uh, uh, as performance the anachronistic Regency Court firsthand. This is just a little bit of a of a um, uh, video of the dance performance that you can go and see as part of your Bridgerton experience. But I would say all is not lost. Chun points to both principles and projects that interrupt and break the patterns and habits of familiarity and sameness that digital culture facilitates. And she challenges us instead to invite difference and discomfort. By engaging theory as a critical disruption against what we might then call consensus tech, she argues for the potential of quote, new patterns we can create together, new forms, forms of relation that include livable forms of indifference. How do we do this? Well, this is where I think how we can make both, uh, it, that is to say, how can we make theater more accessible in digital networks and simultaneously prevent it from following too closely as imitations of existing digital culture that replicate and shift individual preferences, um, idiosyncrasies inextricably and perhaps unwittingly towards the known and the familiar. In other words, how do we prevent our theater becoming so narrow? There's no panacea for this, but theater and specifically I would say theater education I believe can serve as a powerful tool to push back against the familiar and to disrupt comfortable consensus. Continuing to demystify algorithms and putting diverse artists at the center of creative ontologies will be essential. We need a multiplicity of voices to define the terms, framing, and taxonomies in which creative work is collected, analyzed, and shared. Simultaneously, we must also embrace opposition and discomfort. We must seek and teach examples that we and our students do not like. In the opening monologue of Homebody Cobble, uh, Tony Kushner defined this as the challenge of, quote, not succumbing to luxury. And he has many layers that go into this notion of luxury, but for us, it may be familiar and what we know we're already going to like. This is, of course, easier for some of us than others, especially when so many operate within educational systems that replicate features of consumerist culture and encourage similar attitudes in learners. And of course, teachers may be more or less vulnerable to the responses and preferences of our students, as well as social and political pressures, both within and outside the classroom, 
including and certainly not limited to different kinds of occupational precarity. In all, and we've seen lots of examples of that recently, sadly. I am often reminded in, in this of Robert Altman's useful advice, which is that if you're going to tell someone the truth, make them laugh or they'll kill you. For this reason then, I think it is especially important that those of us in secure position, of which I absolutely include myself, take up the challenge of what Jacques Rancière called critical art in The Emancipated Spectator. There, Rancière acknowledged that radical juxtapositions and representations could not on their own guarantee political action. There was not a straightforward road, he argued, from the fact of looking at a spectacle to the fact of understanding the state of the world. Rather, what occurs are processes of dissociation, a break in the relationship between sense and sense, between what is seen and what is thought, and what is thought and what is felt. To this end, he argued for dissensus, not as a conflict of interests, opinions, or values, but rather as a division inserted into common sense, a dispute over what is given and about the frame within which we see something as a given, end quote. So much of our contemporary theater and our teaching and scholarship about theater tends to be geared towards this goal of consensus and agreement, to present evidence and arguments that brings us to common vocabularies and understandings. But if we are con to contest the dominant trends of digital homophilia and its consequences, then we also need to be willing to engage and teach to the edges of our own discomfort and familiarity, to welcome and engage the elements that feel wrong, to create environments in which discordance and dissensus can be rehearsed and perhaps ultimately embraced, to grapple with what doesn't fit and doesn't work. If machine audiences tend towards theaters of agreement, again, this notion of consensus tech, then human audiences must reassert ourselves by embracing the elements of human culture that are unfamiliar, risky, discordant, and even perhaps simply bad. To that end, I now welcome your comments, questions, criticisms, and contestations, because after all, drama, even drama, data drama, is conflict. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sarah. That was uh, a wonderful talk and so many wonderful examples. Um, thank you so much. Um, so um, what we are going to do now is um, we're going to have a discussion and, and uh, Magda is going to lead the discussion and then we also open up to the um, to the audience. I just have one question I would um, like to start with. Um, and since I'm somebody who comes from tragedy, I obviously was very both excited by the sort of genre division as well as um, by the section on tragedy. So um, I totally um, uh, second all you say on, you know, being willing to teach what is discomforting, et cetera. And um, I'm just wondering when you look at like um, working on something like Milopa, how 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 does this tragedy you describe of the sort of dying critic, et cetera, et cetera, how does that actually inform you in something like Milopa? Can it inform that? And how can you teach an algorithm to census or can you? So it's a it's a good question. I mean, doing the doing Milopa as a um as as a as effective consensus building is is, a, is enough of a challenge. I mean, it's it's taken us the better part of of two years to kind of put this all together and 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 try to figure it out. So um it's it's certainly a, allowing for and accounting for the the diversity within it. But at the end of the day, uh, uh you know, computers. And, and machines, like they, they want to follow the, the simplest path, right? So it's about trying to make human performance work legible in, in contexts where computers can share it with each other, right? Where data, data scraping devices, for example, can, um, you know, can, can read, can collect, can get information about a diff different performances. And um, and that those performances can then be fed into recommender systems or search or even feeds that can make them visible and available. And and that's again that becomes really critical because it 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 moves this work into spaces that really need to be where you want this work to be visible, right? Where you want young uh, you know indigenous creators, for example, to have um, opportunities to access audiences. Um, in the same way that, you know, Mervis production can access audiences with its search engine optimization and things like this. So there's a, 
Um, I, I believe there, there's a very strong equ equity argument in the core of that. So Malopa alone is not going to do that. I think the, the key is that as we develop this, we have to be very conscious of what terms and what affinities um, we're replicating within it, right? An algorithm is just a recipe. So it's also about, you know, what's getting fed and collected by whom, for whom, and how is that di distributed? And some of that can be done within a tool like an ontology or like Malopa, but some of it has to be done kind of critically from outside of that, um, not just in the, um, you know, in the, in the tangible digital work that's being done, but also in the, in the, in the receptive, in the create, in the critical work, right. To ask yourself, like, why is this showing up in my feed? Um, to, you know, to, to talk to people about how you break, um, continuous scrolling. I mean, when they introduced the feature of continuous scrolling, um, into social media, it's something like it, it like tripled people's time in, in app, right. Because now it just, it just, it kind of, I mean, it was literally like, like we're overfeeding, on, on the media as well as, you know, in the same way, because we couldn't kind of couldn't step away from it. Um, and so I think it has to be a kind of critical exercise that happens simultaneously. So I think, I, I think these things have to happen in, in concert with each other, um, which is why, um, and I was cognizant of time. So there's a whole other section on Chun, but where she talks really about how the slow humanities, the, the critical theory, are, you know, remain really significant in these conversations and that we shouldn't, you know, we should, we, we can't have one without the other. Like we need, you know, arts and, and, and humanities and, and seemingly uselessness, right? I think there's an argument for what's bad um, and, and unhelpful in these, in these conversations and to put it alongside work that's striving for consensus and effectiveness and efficacy. And so for me, you know, the 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 image of the comedy and, and tragedy masks become a really important kind of emblem because I find that, you know, I've got these two simultaneous perspectives and I don't want to lose the opportunity that the ontology and and um, affords us. But I also don't want to get into a situation where we're replicating the very same kinds of patterns that we've seen be so destructive in other in other domains. And so I think it, it just has to be conscious and, and open and um, and clear. And that's also why I think as we're developing things like, you know, um, data assessments of, of scholarly research in arts and humanities, but particularly, you know, my, my field of the performing arts, but the arts more generally, it's really important that we are doing that um, in a very open way and that we're not letting that just become the domain of for-profit um, uh, data extraction companies. Right. And who are telling us what journals are meaningful and what journals are important and how that feeds into um, into this. So so it's 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 a it's a you know, or go back to the everything I know about anything I learned in theater. Right? You know, it's like, yes. And. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, Marcus, I like a, yeah, go ahead. Ramana. Sorry, I didn't mean to. No, no, Mark, I do chime in and then um, I was thinking, you know, this uh, a kind of a line that you drew from uh, a, you know, the, the, the very basic definition of catharsis as a form of identification to the uh, information bubble that creates uh, you know, uh, uh, both a national and international polarization, yeah? And that there is kind of a, the same mechanism, kind of a narcissistic homily of being fed uh, what what's something that you can recognize yourself in and uh, that is driving those same mechanism. And it, I find it fascinating because does it mean that studying theatrical and cinematic identification can potentially help us uh, figure out how to tackle the, you know, the preference for the information bubble? Like why do we prefer to have information which confirms our, our already pre-existing biases? And that this is, you know, this is quite a complex issue because, I mean, you know, I mean, obviously, you know why it's a complex issue, yeah, but can theater theory in any way help us uh, think through it or try to uh, discover why uh, this process is so, uh, is so deeply rooted in the way that, um, uh, that we construct knowledge today, yeah? And of course, obviously, we have psychologists and sociologists working on it. 
Uh, but do we have something, do we as a field have also something to contribute? I, I, I absolutely do. And I think you've, you've articulated it very well. I mean, the, if we sort of distill theater down into its very basic um, elements, it's, it's looking at other people um, or other performing entities doing things of interest. Right there's there's something that is compelling in a in a defined space. I mean, I don't want to like you know totally overprivilege Peter Brooks and the empty space, but you know uh, it, it, we we kind of come back to it or the you know Aristotle's time you know time space and action right like that that there are these um, you know these very fundamental kind of representations of of being human that um, that are really compelling and that continue to be really compelling, and I think that that precisely what you're saying, understanding the historical, the, the transcultural threads and through lines of, of why we identify with different kinds of performance representations in front of us or not, right? So I think part of this has to be an argument and an investigation of why do we like what we like? You know, what is, what is at the root of our quote unquote taste? And, um, and how do we move Beyond that, I think that's what has always compelled me about experimental work and the avant gardes, um, and in you know, and this balance between familiarity and novelty, um, which is that you know, I I I have you know, for most of my life, sought theater that I that I had never encountered before, right? And I'm always kind of looking for something I I don't know what's going to happen next, and it gets harder and harder the more shows that you see. And, and one of the things and why I've inserted this, this little line, um, you know, about, about my students and what's relatable is I felt like there was this moment and it kind of emerged with social media where, where like the, the marker of what was desirable was what was what reflected you back to you. And, and so I think that's just the most recent iteration of what is a historical, we have lots of historical evidence in lots of different places, but of course, performance is always engaged in a in a dialogue with its cultural moment it's never just reflecting culture it's also shaping it and so i think that that theater theory performance theory but also very specifically in and deliberately in education um becomes really critical because it's this it's this special space to think outside the representations and to ask yourself why do i like what i like why why am I following this this thread and and not another? And also then to ask yourself, well, why am I, you know, why am I getting, you know, um, like a bunch of sea otter videos, for example, right? I'm sort of obsessed with 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 baby, you know, with mama sea otters who put their babies on their on their chests and float around, right? I find it like the most stress relieving thing ever, right? Um, but then there's a moment where I'm like, wow, I'm getting an awful lot of these baby otters. You know, um, and and where and then what else does it does it? And then I get some like weird nature stuff, right? So like, where does this kind of happen, and how do we keep this critical sensibility? And that I think theater always does, especially theater that makes us uncomfortable, that pushes at the edges of what we're expecting. Um, so it's 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 yes, I think I think theater has a lot to offer, and performance theory has a lot to offer. Yeah, I mean, they, you know, they they just the better idea of. Uh, you know, you used to buy uh, New York Times and there were articles, all sorts of different articles. And you had to, you know, like maybe read something about cooking or or what or you know, or politics or, or or business. And now it's you get only what you already click on. And so there is almost virtually impossible to expand your interest unless you're actively seeking that. Yeah. Uh, and it's like, and I'm kind of like, you know, surprised, like, why is it showing up in my, in my feed? Um, you know, um, well, it like accidentally hit on a copy video once and then you got a hundred of them. Yeah. Yes. So, um, so that sort of, uh, I mean, uh, you know, Zucker, Zuckerberg talks about it yeah, because he was a psychology major and that there was a sort of a narcissistic element component to this to those feeds, these contextual feeds, and uh, uh, you know, contextual feeds and that are driven by contextual algorithms are, are kind of foundation. This is what keeps glue to the to the to the social media. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it, and not just the social media. I mean, this is the other the other piece that I think is really is really critical. Um, uh, several years ago, I was invited to a to a lunch with with Reed Hastings, the co-founder of of um, of Netflix, uh, because he was a Bowdoin alum and had had come to to Bowdoin College to do some things. And and someone asked him, you know, how would you describe Netflix? <laughs> and he said, Netflix is you. Uh, he said, you know, so it's really, if you're a horror fan, Netflix is your, is your destination repository of all things, you know, like, like a, just a great horror film archive. And if you're an evangelical Christian, uh, it's, you know, it's a, it's a Christian, it's an evangelical, it's a Christian television station, right? It was this idea and it, and it, and it roots it back into, um, you know, um, Times Person of the Year, I think for 2007, um, uh, Diana Taylor writes about this, that had the 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 Mylar um, uh, computer monitor on the cover of, of Time magazine. And it was a it was a mirror. And it was like Person of the Year in 2007 was you. Um, and I, you know, I remember joking with some friends that like we should all put that on our CVs. Right. Like, and by the way, in 2007, I was Times Person of the Year. Um, uh, but this, but that was, that was the, that was the impetus from the beginning. But it, it comes a lot from, you know, it didn't begin with that. It, those techniques came from, from marketing, from theater. Um, but it's, it's these, it's the unexpected juxtaposition. And that's what, that's what life online has really robbed us of. There is almost no serendipitous encounter anymore. Like I've taken to reading the paper newspaper again because the ads, you know, like I, I it sounds really silly. Like I'm reading the paper for the ads, but because because they're not ads that are targeted to me, right? They're they they and so an advertising says something about the culture in which I live that have that have been somebody's idea about what a reader of this particular newspaper might enjoy, but it is not based on the fact that it's tracking me and my particular geolocation or my uh you know shopping preferences or any anything like that. And so I think there's there are these opportunities for openness that can be um and and surprise and encounter that are being that are that are really being lost. And again, I'm I'm less concerned about the boomers and the Gen Xers because as you saw from the earlier data, you know, we're kind of still getting our culture where we always got it. It's really it's it's where my students and and younger collaborators are getting information and and in very formative times right this is this is like feeding not only you know like their uh, their sense of of their taste and and what they like but also their sense of themselves and so thinking really um you know i i think i take my responsibility to my students very seriously in trying to give them a very clear um, set of critical perspectives and tools and questions that they can start to unpack this because they're not all going to become data scientists and understand, you know, and and reverse engineer the algorithms in their lives, but they can absolutely become critical viewers of what gets presented to them as as how some program sees them and where they can resist that. And so it's 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 why that total recall line has stuck with me all these years later, right? Is that it really gets underneath, like how how do we know what we like anymore? You know, it was uh, uh, 60 minutes uh, about this, um, about TikTok, yeah? That this is a sort of a question of national security because TikTok uses different algorithms for American teenagers and Chinese teenagers. And American teenagers are fed a kind of a consistent a feed of junk information. And for this reason, you know, their, prefer their, their, their preference for jobs is to like be influencer or a movie star, yeah? Or celebrity, not even a movie star, a celebrity, like, you know, like for nothing, like, you know, Kim Kardashian, yeah? And uh, children in China, youth in China, like wants to be an astronaut because their algorithm feeds them uh, educational content and manipulates them into uh, having uh, scientific, exploratory, and intellectual ambitions. And 60 Minutes presented this as a kind of, you know, this is a sort of Trojan horse to, to, to kind of um, dumb down entire generation of American citizenry 
um, that is part of a hybrid you know, welfare. Actually, um, Marta, can we maybe, because we have two questions in the chat. Yeah, and go ahead. One mm -hmm. yeah, sorry, I didn't see anything, but now I think we do have them, yeah? Right. So, yeah, so I have, like, I have one that we can maybe tag on to your comments about TikTok and Sarah, maybe you can speak to that. So Felix Stenger is, uh, is asking, to, uh, I'm just going to read it out. I'm very sympathetic with the notion of Francia, distress difference, division, dissociation, etc. And I'm wondering if those principles aren't also fundamental operators of the digital. Isn't the identifying bubble of similar elements not just one part of social media? I'm not a TikTok user, but I'm always thrilled how my other social media feeds mix up fashion or sports with war footage or politics. Isn't TikTok a huge montage device? And is that not so far away from the disruption that runs here opts for? So that would be kind of like the opposite end of the spectrum to the 60 minutes. Um, yeah, and maybe you can speak to both. <laughs> so I, I would say that that the... Um... I mean, so the I, I I didn't see that episode, but I've 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 read some of the similar kinds of anxieties and critiques, and and of course, I mean, you know, talk about the origins of of you know theater and Western drama, um, you know, like the corruption of the young um, and warping their minds in ways that are going to undermine the polis, right? Is is sort of you know rooted in the in in kind of the the very basis fundamentals of the of the anti-theatrical prejudice right like oh like i mean so this this again um the more things change the more they the, they stay the same um this question about about tiktok as a kind of radical dissensus montage device i think is a is a very is a really good one and and social media and media consumption in general i think absolutely has it i mean in 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 many ways the a, a social media feed can at times look like what you know the Dadaists would have fantasized about, right? This idea that you could have a captive audience seeing, you know, random, short, weird, maybe somewhat disturbing um, performances that those could all, you know, like like be delivered. So there is a a, a notion of this, and um, and they and I think that. That every combination uh, on, in social media has the potential to um, affirm or disrupt, and so I think it's it's less it's less about what is there and more about how we understand what is being communicated to us. And and if we go to Wendy Chun, who I, I really recommend her essay. Um, this is from the um, a very slim, but one of those really. It's a, I think it's the University of Minnesota. Those lovely like little little books. Um, so it's like four four critical essays called Pattern Discrimination, and the the querying homophily is 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 just a great exploration in thinking through. I think he um, uh, I can't remember who else is in the collection off the top of my head, but um, Hiro Steyerl I think is there. Um, anyway, but what she sort of talks about is. Um, is that it's, you know, it's, it's, it becomes really insidious and very naturalized. And so um, the, the combinations that you see in some ways reflect things that you are um, compelled by, even when they themselves are very different from one another, right? So, so thinking about, um, you know, sports and politics or fashion and, you know, puppy videos um, on on one kind of content plane. They're like, wow, those are really a lot of very different things. But I think where the where the more profound dissensus has to happen is that. But if those are all things that I know that I like, um, there's a kind of I become the kind of unifying principle within them. And I think that that's really where the more fundamental dissensus has to come, which is. You know, why does that, why, why does this combination appeal to me? Why are these things that even if they're very different from each other, um, you know, what, why do they, why, you know, why do they come in? And again, the, the promise of theater is always that there's going to be something that doesn't, that, that doesn't align with your expectations. Um, and I made a very brief reference to it in this, but, but one of the other things that, that is really interesting is the Ian Chang piece, uh, B.O.B. or Bag of Beliefs, which is an artificial life form that he was very invested in um, gaining sentience because of its um, failed expectations, right? So that project was all about um, the, 
the the entity that he developed um expecting certain things to happen and being disappointed or surprised when there when the expectations of of the of the life form were not met and then adjusting um even absorbing um disappointment rejection um like things that were sort of you know painful um and and in relationship to to viewers and there's it, it's a it's a fascinating piece um in and i haven't seen it so i just to be very clear but in the way that it's described and in and in the documentation of it um and it reminds me a lot of chris verdonk the the belgian artist's work um who also sees the sort of element the the fundamental humanity as being vulnerability and so creating machines that are that fail that are vulnerable and so i think i think there's a whole thread of of what we can sort of identify as the census and 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 not just surprise but but moments of failure disruption or um things that are unexpected and and unfamiliar and also unpleasant um because we see a huge drive in many domains now to really reinforce things that are um that align with our expectations and what we're looking for and sometimes those are very those make a lot of sense right i don't think i'm keen to make theater work that you know that triggers someone's um you know uh sensibilities or or creates an unpleasant or or even harmful or traumatic experience you know but at the same time um i think it's keeping ourselves aware and open to things that that we you know that are uncomfortable right and and finding a space between harm and discomfort where we can really start to to think through and pick apart um you know what 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 do we like and and again i keep coming back to this very banal language but of the like because and taste and preference because that has become so much the dominant regime and epistemological context uh or i would say epistemology of contemporary culture like everything is now aligned as like and dislike and alignment and and um and and at odds and we just see this and as it moves into things that are far more material than what you know what shows you know show up in your google search you know it has to do with where people live and how they experience each other and so really trying to it's it's not a there's not a technological solution it's sort of to maybe the the second question around algorithms and whether those can help to serve um you know there there's certainly ways to be critical and to invest in and to really dig into algorithms that can be disruptive but even more than that it's about kind of taking it apart and thinking through how do we um how do we remain critical i mean at the end of the day um it's all variations of user error and so i i think that that's why we have to really invest in a a certain kind of educational project and educational ambition that that keeps us critical and not reliant on other um on other technologies to to solve one technological problem with another thank you i was just wondering actually um if we could i really would like to go back to america's got talent and that um that video sure <laughs> hilarious um but also because of what you were saying um about the um you know the fact that they didn't actually win right um that um you know the three tenors that didn't really work ultimately and i'm kind of still wondering whether you could say more about why you think that is the case because i think there is there is something about like you know performing criticism in a way but but there is another level it seems to me in which there is a realm in which technology is allowed to sort of support and enhance the virtuosity of a performer but um not substitute it and i would mm-hmm. say that the fake is a substitution here that then feels like a yeah feel, feels like cheating or something like that i'm i'm, not, I'm and i'm wondering what wh- why how do you see this sort of failure to win on that part because technologically it's obviously incredible what they're doing there and it's really and it's fun and it's cheeky and like whatever so yeah. um yeah, I don't know how. Do you have anything further on 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 that example? Oh, so 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 many thoughts. I mean, I you know, at one point I thought about doing this talk entirely about America's Got Talent and just you know just just talking about that that show because for exactly the reasons you point out, which is that um, you know what what wins, what doesn't win, um, and how does that play out? I mean, one of the things. I mean, it's really interesting if you want to go back and read the criticisms of fans that, that fans of the show had 
about um about uh about that piece advancing right like so it 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 made it into the semifinals and that was fine and then the the response online was like okay but we've already seen this like they've already done it like it's not it's not developing whereas like there is a you know like any game show um there's a strategy to to playing the game really well and one of the strategies is america's got talent is that as you advance your work actually has to refine and improve and continually surprise right so it has to it has to be what we would think of as um as, as virtuosic, as great virtuosic performance, which is that it continually, um, it, it, it fulfills our expectations of skill and talent and, and ability and finds things that we haven't seen before, right? So it, it sort of combines the best of the familiar and the novel. And we, and you see that with each of the, 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 it's interesting that the other two are dance performances, right? That are, that are all about embodiment, but they're both embedded within these, you know, um, uh, illusionist kind of con contexts and things like this. I mean, it's, it's really quite fascinating how they, how they emerge. Um, but, but they, they always are kind of upping their game. Right. And that, that I use that phrase very deliberately because occasionally, um, people were talking, you know, you're really going to have to up your game or, right. You're going to have to take it to the next level. Um, uh, you know, this idea of continual improvement is also a mantra um, that goes within this, like, it's not just enough to do what you've done. So that was one of the criticisms against the metaphysic guys. Um, although they went from one person, right. They, I think they, I can't remember who they did first. I think it was Simon Cow or who, I can't remember who it was. And then they went to all three, which is, which is really, I mean, like, like what they have managed to do is astounding, right. That they did it in real time, that it synced, I mean, it's, it's, it's really such a, such a, but it's also a technological, a, 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 you know, accomplishment that also remember becomes incredibly muted when you're watching it on your TV stream, because it's, it's a, it's because it really looks like somebody could be lip syncing. Right. So you get away from like, what makes it, what makes it really, you know, tremendously powerful. Um, so I think it's, it's this notion of embodiment. So in terms of why they didn't win, I actually think had it been up to the judges alone, they would have won. Um, but of course, the they're they're there to they're not there to actually judge talent. They're there to make money. And so when it became clear that their audience, right, was shifting in 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 various ways, uh, you know, then that begins to have its own its own kind of impact. And I you'll have to forgive me. I can't remember actually if they how they make that final decision if they vote or or what the what what the what the mechanism is i think it's chosen by the by the by the judges as opposed to like idol where the judges pass it along and then there's a big a big vote but i thought that you know for me it just captures so perfectly what it is that we're looking for in performance and digital performance and and who's compelled by that and who's not right like if they had taken a random person from the audience and done the same exercise you know would that have been more compelling um, than, than, the, than the judges. Cause I mean, the other thing too, is I talk about Simon Cowell and his sort of like horror delight, but Terry Crews is like, just, he's here for it. Right. He just stands up and basks in, you know, in himself as opera singer, which I also think is really interesting. Yeah. That's true. Okay. Well, it has a little bit of a gimmicky quality to it. Yeah. Like once you get the gimmick to like, okay, like, so what? And I mean, this is, this was partially you know, while we had this um, in the early 2000s, the, the technology in theater was mostly gimmicky. And it's like, okay, you can make it work, like, so what? And the kind of a next question was not answered in some way. And and that sort of, you know, gimmickness can feel like it overshadows the natural talent, yeah? Which, uh, as you mentioned, is uh, is trying to suggest that the talent needs some kind of help in order to shine, that it needs a gimmick. And so maybe that's why people did not really respond to it. In, in that. Yeah. We have, a, we have a one more question from an audience. And the question is, uh, how could algorithms um, help to actually serve and support a critical and emancipated spectator and help keep the discourse, um, the census alive? So what sort of algorithms would, would um, 
you know, shatter the information bubbles. Um, I mean, this would have to be the, have some form of opposite algorithm, I suppose, not contextual one, yeah? So I, I kind of I, I kind of mentioned this earlier, but I, I don't I don't think that there's an algorithmic technological solution um, uh, uh, to this. I mean, I think you know you can. It's a little bit like you know people got and and I you know I I certainly had this feeling at some point. People got very worried about about um, uh, digital search in libraries in the in the early days. They're like, oh, people will no longer go to the library. And 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 you will no longer have the encounter, right? The the sort of serendipitous random encounter with the books that are next to the books you're looking for, right? Um, you'll you'll just find it. And I think we're seeing this. And I and I think that that is true, right? And so then then now I don't know if your library has it. Ours does. Um, you know, you you pull up whatever book you're looking for, and then it's like near a, on the shelf, right? It kind of tries to mimic. Here are the other books around this book that you're looking for. Um, I think we're seeing a similar kind of thing in journals, right? I'm not quite sure anymore what the point of of a of a of a bound journal or even a special issue, issue journal is anymore because so much of the time, journal articles I'm thinking academic articles are found individually, right? So we use search terms and we're and they're usually read. And and maybe maybe this is just me and my, you know, maybe other people do it differently, but they're often read opportunistically, right? Like, I, you know, I can't remember the last time I got a journal and I sat down. I'm like, well, let me read this entire journal. Like, I might look at the at the table of contents and then I'll dip in and out of it. But most of the time, I'm trying to get some, you know, I, I have some reason or something I'm particularly looking for, putting a lit review together or whatever. And so I'm gathering all of that uh, all of that information simultaneously. So. Um, so I think that's already changed in the way that we we approach these things, and and the algorithms can be, you know, better or worse. I mean, an algorithm is just a recipe, right? It's just showing you things. So certainly we could have have algorithms that um, that show you something utterly random or totally discordant, or that you know, like that operate on principles of the avant garde. Um, in in terms of just you know like like a like a surrealist algorithm like a surrealist search algorithm it's like you know I'm looking for um, you know like dishwashers and you know and it'll give me uh, I don't know a bunch of frogs in the middle of it or something like that right I mean you know so so certainly we we can we can program and do those things you know in 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 helpful ways but but over time. I think the the key is that things tend towards smoothness and consensus, right? Like that there is a there is a desire for refinement and reinforcing what people think they want. And so, however however much dissensus we build in at the beginning, is likely to be mitigated and moderated um, over time and 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 usage, unless or until we install a different kind of critical receptivity and a different kind of critical engagement and emphasis um, in uh, going forward. So I think that's where, again, I think it has to be on the on the individual, on the user side that really pushes in and invests in this. Um, in, in sciences, they already have, you know, the preprint, yeah? That it's sort of everybody, you know, can read and comment and, you know, peer review paper and there are some platforms that open up for humanities you know, that have to try sure. to the model. So in some ways, the journal becomes, you know, because journals have become databases. So why can't we just skip the whole idea of a journal and just, you know, create a database, yeah, in the, in the first place? Um, so that's what I think. I mean, there is, you know, there is some kind of, I don't know if, you know, if the cachet, prestige, the history of the journal, like what, Truly, you know, like it does it like in our field, like I don't know if it's it's if it's that if it's that important since all of us do that sort of research, typically focused on what we we look for, what we look for, and we use databases for the purposes, yeah. So um, so so I'm not sure. I mean, I do like the idea of a journal. You know, it's still somewhat appealing to have a specially um, curated issue on a particular topic, yeah, and that's. That's still appealing because it's somebody thinking through the field at the moment and trying to capture 
what is going on in a particular subject. And that one, if this you know, hits your subject, you read it from, you know, from, um, but, but, uh, but the random kind of, I mean, I don't know, like this is sort of um, something that I think we will move towards a more of a scientific model. But I'm wondering though, because like, I feel there are other, I have a couple of other examples that maybe are kind of like saving the journal. Um, so basically, especially when they're digital actually, and they're not a bound copy. So because then with the sort of multimedia aspect of it, you can kind of do more interesting stuff um, in the way that how you, act, how these kind of combine. And uh, the one example that I have that I really thought was just beautiful and kind of like almost like an artistic piece in and of itself was um, the performance philosophy journal did a podcast issue where they had like they they did over the course of like um, a couple of months they released like four different episodes in a way that that all then constituted the journal in the end and so there were all these different conversations and sort of exercises and things that sort of happened as part of it and I thought there for example this really was something that you know was a performance as well because you were sort of like came back to it and and um and received it and um and engaged with it um again and again and it was like a different version of a Netflix series so um so yeah so I thought that was um maybe we also have to just rethink of how we want to structure the journal or how we want to um what we want to do with it well let me, let me just be especially because this will circulate beyond this this conversation um and, th and this temporal moment um I mean no disrespect to the people who edit um uh academic journals it is an, an enormous amount of work and labor that that really is essential to the field and to the the circulation and documentation and collection of, of of knowledge, right? And so, in many ways, I think there is a kind of unbalanced and even extractive relationship between the databases and 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 journals and and the scholars who certainly um, who publish in them. Um, but especially the those who edit them. So I just I want to be very clear about that. Um, I'm also not anti-journal. It just the the only thing I will say is that it it really strikes me that the function and the role of the journal has has shifted in some really significant ways. And yet, um, kind of like you know like our little save icon, you know in our in our it, it you know refers to and still some platforms as like a little floppy disk from um you know from from the 1980s 1990s um that that the format or the 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 framing of of the journal no longer aligns with with how it is best used and i think the idea of 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 you know journals being and articles being multimodal is really critical that you can put them into databases that there becomes a kind of organizing structure for for fields or for scholarly organizations and things like that um, I think that's really critical. Um, I really love podcasts. I love podcasts as form of, uh, and and I love them because they're especially when they're dialogic. I don't I don't typically listen to to just um, single author recordings, although sometimes those are fun. But it's mostly I'm interested in the in the dialogue, and that's I think what you're talking about, Magda, with the um, the the preprints and the conversation and things like you know the the MLA Commons or Common Press um uh or these like you know open source publishing where ideas i mean i'm thinking i think mackenzie quark work was one of the first people who did that when when they published um i think it was gamer theory um was published every every chapter was put you know online as a kind of blog for people to comment and 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 do stuff with so um you know certainly the digital affords this i guess i'm i'm thinking more on the on the research end which is you know, when I'm looking for something or I'm going to read it, um, you know, I think you're exactly right, Magda, like like journals are really function like databases, but somehow we haven't acknowledged that that that's what they are. You know, so we, we're still treating them like like books, um, but we but we haven't figured out yet how to um, how to kind of dovetail them into uh, and, and treat them like databases. I mean, the problem is also that, you know, those, data, those people who manage databases are paid a lot of money and the authors and journals don't. And so the issue of open access, you know, uh, is, I think, going to be a, 
kind of an ex-frontier. I mean, some universities have refused to purchase access to those uh, databases and you know, more and more people make their own article. Like I always make my articles available online uh, in some form, even if it's a you know paid journal, just so people can find it. And right. hopefully, like if they can find it somewhere on your know, academia website, this is not gonna go into your um, you know your um, score on on JSTOR. Yeah, like how many reads or whatever, right. or on Google, you know, Google search. Um, it's gonna affect those those metrics. And if they're important for your field. Uh, this is not what you're gonna do, but I you know. But I do like even the scientific, the government model, where everything that is paid for by the government uh, gets to be available online, and you can do quite sophisticated scientific research using the government-sponsored um, databases. Um, and it's like you know, it's something that we don't necessarily have in humanities, but in, in particularly in our field, and people who don't have access to those research libraries, you know, um, are precluded from the conversation oftentimes because, um, you know, the contingent faculty who have to, you know, um, teach, uh, not a lot, making not a lot of money, like, you know, you oftentimes you cannot afford your own article, yeah, which costs like, you know, $40 somewhere to buy the published version. And so that's just, that's kind of silly. So, um, and the accumulation of knowledge uh, inside uh, the top schools and not having access to that knowledge globally and you know even in the US smaller schools or people in um, in in precarious positions uh, cannot engage in that kind of research and so 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 like on the one hand I am pro database but on the other hand I am extremely anti database for all of those reasons of knowledge hugging and knowledge hoarding and and the paywalls and all of those things. So in some ways, I guess my my fantasy database would be something what you know what the US government has for the sciences, where they actually pay for it. Um, so having a, having an alternative database of humanities articles, which would be available and free to the public, would be a kind of a you know dream goal. Mm-hmm. And so interesting, you know, why the why does the science makes the research publicly available and why we have in humanities which we make less money than they you know why we have to pay to access those you know why and why people who create those databases felt that humanities uh, need to be behind paywall you know and sciences don't uh, so it's it's a kind of an interesting conversation between sciences and humanities about uh, access to knowledge and and distribution of knowledge and um, and by publication process and you know the status of the publication process and the discourse that is happening around publication. It was a quite interesting article about the the, the kind of the the, the 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 peer review itself outlive its purpose uh, because the research progresses so fast, particularly in sciences, the peer review oftentimes hinders it. And it's kind of too sloppy to actually account for. But it's better to have people comment on the article on Twitter. Um, you get more out of it than you get from peer review. Yeah, because on Twitter, you know, you have both specialists and random people asking you, you know, simple questions that you have not answered. Yeah. And scientists who work on the same research that you do are asking questions and pointing out faults with your research. So, you know, the, the sort of scientific Twitter is is quite well and alive as a as a as a public forum for that kind of criticism. And we have not yet embraced that positive uh, side of social media for humanities. Though I though I do see more and more humanities scholars um, you know, getting feedback and posting their work and trying to, but we don't have that sort of tradition of posting preprints. Um, it's like no, that's not something that we do. So We'll see how, but, you know, the, we, we still also, you know, uh, obviously I'm part of this. We also still read our papers to each other as opposed to, you know, I mean, we, we have a number of different practices that are sort of disciplinary specific. I mean, you talked about a couple of really interesting things there, you know, in terms of, of open access and what research is available for whom and by whom. I mean, one of the things that is true about the, the humanities is that 
we're less well funded at virtually every, you know, in at every stage and in every way. And so just and and that a lot of these databases are um, you know, are are being run for profit. So, you know, when you've got um, you know, a certain level of 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 investment of and I'm not sure exactly how it, how it works for for each one, but I know that in some instances, um, in scientific journals, the you know the funding model is such that people there's resources to pay into and for open access. So the the journal is the 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 database is making money on that end, so they can make things more available, um, and they're selling. The database itself to libraries and to at I mean at, at at really quite exorbitant fees. I mean the the cost of these databases, um, as opposed to sort of one offs, um, is really is really striking. And I remember um, I was at the University of Buffalo when we made a shift from uh, journal subscriptions for a number of uh, of high use journals to these data to to databases, and then. Over time, because I sat on this libraries committee, it seemed like every meeting we were voting to allocate more and more budget away from monographs and um, and print journals to fund the databases. Because the minute you like, if you stop a journal subscription, you still have all the stuff that you bought. Whereas with the database, the minute you stop funding it, you lose everything. So you lose access to the to the whole the whole thing. And, you know, this is about the same time that Adobe moved from, you know, um, software on on CDs and DVDs to licenses, right, that that could that had to be renewed and that could be so, you know, student designers who had been able to, you know, use off, work off their student licenses for years, even after they graduated, you know, as soon as they were no longer enrolled as students, like, you know, their Adobe subscriptions went up. I mean, it, it moved to the whole um, a whole different funding model, which is now also what we have in social media, right? I mean, social media, and this is what the the person of the year article in Time back in two thousand seven was all about. It's it's that you know it's a different kind of compelled labor in which people contribute their time, attention, energy, expertise, whatever, into a system that then aggregates, monetizes, and sells the whole thing back. Um, and what you're really buying is the system. And in social media, we pay for that with our data. And in um, in academia, we pay for it with, um, you know, with with outright dollars or funding dollars or research dollars or institutional dollars. But the principle is exactly the same, right? Which is that, you know, why am I, I'm contributing my little bit to this. And then, it, and then as you're pointing out, I can't even afford to buy my own article. Um, and it's because, because I'm not actually paying for my article. I'm paying for my article to live in a vast network that purports to, and I think in many instances does, you know, elevate it and put it into conversation with a number of other things. And so, I mean, this is, this is, I mean, this is what Lev Minovich was, was writing about like back in 2001, the language of new media, when he argued that the, you know, kind of artistic creation uh, of the 21st century was the data, the database. And that this was, this was the kind of fundamental way that we, that we think through this. Um, and it's, and, you know, I, I have many of the same concerns and, and, and challenges. And at the same time, as you start to dig into what, what would this mean institutionally? What would this mean, even a consortium of institutions? Um, you know, it gets it gets very challenging because it's a little bit like telling people um, uh, that they don't need cell phones, right? When when your access into these systems is by and large now dictated by a mobile phone, and and you know, and so it's I think this is where our, we have a moment around this idea of theatrical representation online and the performing arts being represented and artistic research and scholarship being represented online and in digital networks where we have an opportunity to define that in a different way, to set some different parameters, but also to build a kind of educational mindset and framework that, that, that applies the lessons of the past 25 years in ways that may help us 
navigate it and not simply replicate the the worst of it because like data is coming for us and either we will define how it is being used and to what ends and what is getting elevated within it or someone else is going to figure out how to do it and make a lot of money and then they're going to set up a system and then that's going to become the context in which we all then you know operate and understand our work and ourselves um in that in you know in in that system and so I, I really do think there's a certain amount of urgency, which is why there's a, a number of different kind of simultaneous but related and connected research projects happening right now around arts in and as uh, as data and, and cultural data and what that might look for look like in the next in the next several years. All right, uh, we have to wrap it up, but um, thank you so much, Sarah, for this wonderful discussion, and uh, we thank. Um, Mahindra Humanities Center and Harvard Meta Lab for hosting us. We invite our audiences to sign up for the future uh, seminars this semester and review the order of the past ones and they are online posted. And uh, Sarah's uh, seminar will also uh, be available online soon. Um, so now I'm going to pause the recording.